I'm Phil Hambecker. Uh, I work for Komodo Group. Uh, Komodo Group is a certification authority, as you will find out from uh, the story I'm going to be telling you. I've uh, been with Komodo now for almost two years. Uh, Komodo considers itself the Pepsi of the certification authority business. And before that, I spent 12 years with the company that considered itself Coke. I, and before that, I spent uh, two and a half years at MIT and two years at CERN, uh, where I was working on projects like putting the web into the White House. I was Tim Berners-Lee's security consultant at CERN. And so this year marks uh, 20 years working in web security. So it's all my fault. So I'm going to be talking about um, an attack on one of our data center and what this means for the future of internet security. And when you come to these things, you know, there's a certain mindset of, you know, be very afraid. Your future is going to be just like Hollywood pr promised it would be, but with way cooler graphics. Well, no, I mean, like, what I'm talking about is, at this point, a very, very rare attack. It's a form of attack and a motive of attack which is, you know, it is difficult to see unless you go out and look for it. The dominant problem of web security today is, of course, organized cybercrime, money is the motive, and it's credit card fraud, it's bank fraud, it's all the other types of fraud. It's the advanced fee fr frauds. So do we need to worry about cyber war at all? I mean, like, is it just all hype? Well, let's uh, fast forward a bit. I mean, like, at the moment, you know, everybody's saying, well, it's all about money. But well, let's rewind a little. Before it was all about money, it was all about people like this kid. Can anybody recognize him? Kevin Mitnick. Uh, when I was uh, a grad student being sponsored by DEC, he uh, penetrated one of our systems and required us to reinstall VMS on every machine in Digital Equipment Corporation. That was about 50,000 hosts. And if any of you have ever installed VMS, you will know that it is a multi, multi-day affair. So when Dex said that uh, Micnic cost them $5 million, that was almost certainly an underestimate. Now, when I was working on web security in the early days, people were, were saying, well, you know, you're just scaremongering. You're just, talk it's, it's all hype. Nobody is stealing money off the web. Nobody steals money off the internet. These kids then just misunderstood teenagers with angst. They wouldn't do anything wrong. They wouldn't rob. They wouldn't steal. They're just vicious little vandals. And you know, in the early days of web security, it was really hard to get people to accept the idea that money could be the motive. But let's rewind a little before that. Anybody care to remember what, uh, before Mitnick and the Morris Worm, what was our attack model? Anybody remember? Cuckoo's egg. Uh, it was an attack on what was, I guess at the time it would be ARPANET, uh, in that it's pretty much pre-internet. And if, you re if you've not read Clifford's book, it's a really great way to understand both the early internet and the way that people, you know, the way it used to go to put to be put together, but also what was one, you know, the first case of cyber espionage. So, you know, we started with this model of state-sponsored hacking, and now we've come full circle. So what's changed in between? Well, the cuckoo's egg, that attack, what happened, you know, it was a walk-in. It wasn't the East German intelligence agency decided to penetrate 
US government computers. They didn't decide to penetrate the NSA and Dockmaster and so on. What happened was the hackers were busy penetrating networks having fun. They got into Dockmaster, which was the NSA computer on the internet at the time. They found some information that they thought was interesting, and then they thought, oh, who can we sell it to? They went to the East German embassy, and they found a, a buyer. So that was a walk-in. You know, it was, 25 years ago, cyber warfare, cyber engagement, cyber intelligence wasn't even on the map. Today, it's right there at cabinet level. It's right at the top of government. Uh, when we were putting the web into the White House, um, you know, th the marching orders really did come from Al Gore. He was our greatest supporter. He got us the money to set up the web consortium. He got the money to set up the internet. It's not just in the US, however, that these discussions are at cabinet level. There's an organization called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was essentially a, a bilateral treaty between Russia and China to which a number of other companies ha uh, countries have been invited in. And so, you know, if you look, it's basically the ex-USSR plus China. Uh, and there's this region here. That's pretty much uh, the most unstable region in the world at the moment. If Syria falls, the wave of chaos from the Arab Spring goes right to the heart of the border between Russia and China. So the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, basically exists to prevent the domination of the world by any other power. Can you guess who that might be? Um, well, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that this is Russia and China recognizing that their biggest threat is actually that they get into a war between each other. So you set up an alliance and you pretend that uh, you're fighting the US because it'd be better than fighting each other because they've kind of like got borders. Now one of the treaties that they signed in 2007 is a cooperation treaty on cyber engagement and cyber warfare. It, you know, it depends upon how you translate it because obviously you know, it's in Russian. That's a very fascinating document. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that they, they pledge to agree to stop is what they call information terrorism. Anybody care to guess what information terrorism might be? Not quite. Well, yes, that would be a, that, yes they'd call it propaganda, yes. Uh, we would more likely call it freedom of speech. The, it, it, it also commits Russia and China to, um, to work together to stop the domination of the information space by any one party. And you can, depending upon how you translate the text, you can read that as the US or you can read it as Google or Microsoft. Yeah. Now, this is an international treaty. Treaties are decided at the cabinet level of government. So here we have cyber right at the top of government. And that's what's changed in the past 30 years since Cuckoo's Egg. It's no longer a minor thing. It's now right at the top. So what does this mean? You know, what changes uh, for us as information security professionals? Well, one big change is that money isn't the only motive that you have to think about. I mean, it used to be that if you weren't a site that dealt with money, if you weren't a site that had a checkout or a storefront, you weren't a bank, well, you know, you could have a somewhat lax attitude to, to security. You know, you might be involved in some form of cyber hacking attack, but it would be kind of like using you as a vector to get somebody else. The motives in this case, it, you know, it's national pride, it's national security interests, it's all sorts of, you know, it's the interest of states. It is also 
the interests of individuals within those states. In that, you know, when you read CNN or Fox or whatever, they'll talk about you know, Iran doing this or the US doing that. Well, that really doesn't make any sense. I mean, like, you know, if you think about the US government, I mean, how many million people do you have working for it? Do they, do they all have the same point of view? I mean, like, most of the time I'm spending my time, um, I will have the State Department will be pleased with me, I'll have the DOD, which thinks I'm a public enemy number one. Uh, which is an advantage, you know, 20 years ago, one half of the NSA thought I was uh, evil incarnate, and the other half thought I was wonderful. <laughs> you know, because you know, NSA does hacking and does defense. You know? So the motives are political, and it, often they are personal political, and advancing the personal interests of the parties involved. Uh, well, right, uh, well, intellectual property comes under espionage. Espionage, by definition, is not warfare. Espionage may be preparatory for warfare, but espionage is not use of force. One of the reasons that it is defined in that way is that unless two parties actually engage in use of force, i.e. war, or intend to, espionage is actually stabilizing. You know, if we had known that the Soviet Union had had crop failure after crop failure throughout the 1970s, then we probably wouldn't have spent the 1980s ramping up our Western military budgets to counter a perceived Soviet threat that, you know, if, you'd, if we'd have had the information, we'd have known was preposterous. In the case of China, yes, they, they do have an extremely large espionage program. And, you know, it, it, it's a machine. You know, they, and, you know, that has an effect on US companies. It's also having a big effect on China. And that effect is that uh, they're completely destroying any capability, any chance that they can create a native capability to do research and development. You know, if you're a Chinese engineer and you want to do, you want to build stuff, you have to come to the States or the West. Because if you stay in China, well, your only job is going to be interpreting Western designs. Yeah, that, that, that is espionage. It isn't use of force. So um, it's reprehensible. But I'm trying to concentrate here on the shooting. You know, I, I, I could go on for a day on espionage as well. So the mo money is the motive uh, for that. You know, the hackers are rewarded by how much information and how many secrets they can steal. So second change in perspective is the capabilities they bring. Yeah. If you're talking about your organized criminals on the net, the amount of money they steal basically determines the amount of capabilities they can bring. Yeah. If you are a lone hacker and you just hack for fun, well, you're not going to be able to buy zero-day attacks from somebody else. You're not going to be able to cooperate with a wide circle of other hackers. If you're hacking for, fun, for profit, you can pay other hackers to do services that you don't do yourself. You know, you've got a network. So money's not only the motive, money's the enabler. It's the thing that gives you the capabilities. When you're talking about states, well, money can be involved, but you know, at the end of the day, you guys put a man on the moon. There ain't any hacking group that comes remotely close to that capability. Yeah. So as far as our attack model goes, you know, when we designed the CA infrastructure for the web, 
and the web PKI. We designed it from the point of view of controlling commercial risk. We designed it to reduce the attraction of attacking our infrastructure to the commercial hacker by increasing the cost of breaking our systems. And now we have an actor that comes along that essentially has infinite supplies of money. That's a major change in the threat model. And finally, there's a big difference in the target. The targets in the Iranian attack were not Komodo, Diginotar, wasn't Microsoft, wasn't Facebook. It was the people of Iran. And the reason that they were targeting them was that the government of Iran did not want to see this happen in Iran. And that's uh, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The motive is political, not the national security interests of Iran. It's the personal interests of the politicians involved. OK, so I've got to Iran. And um, actually, when I found this uh, GIF, you know, I was just looking for a picture of Iran as a placeholder. And I thought, oh, I'll just put that in. I'll put another one in later. Uh, but actually, um, in the weeks since I wrote this talk, this pretty much is describing the attack map, in that uh, what has been breaking out in the past three weeks is uh, major denial of service attacks, penetration attacks, all up and down the uh, oil infrastructure of the Gulf. That's where they, their money comes from. And so we attacked Iran, as I will explain. And so now they are working to cut off our oil supply any way they can. Now, the thing about the oil, though, is that it really has decided the destiny of Iran. So let's rewind again. To understand Iranian politics, you have to understand this one event. It's the pivotal moment, 19th of August, 1953. And this was when the Iranian democracy was extinguished, courtesy of the CIA. Probably the stupidest and most counterproductive act that they did. Um, it was the coup that uh, established the Shah as a dictator. And as you might expect, that was really the mainspring of the uh, revolution in 79. And had a lot to do with this event, the storming of the uh, US embassy. Uh, the reason that the uh, students were storming the embassy was because the embassy had been the hub from which the 53 coup was uh, plotted. And when the Shah was allowed into the US for medical treatment, uh, they were afraid that there might be a counter-revolution in planning, and so they stormed the embassy. There was a second reason that the Ayatollah was interested in storming the embassy, and that was to get their hands on, or at least, if possible, destroy otherwise, uh, the information inside the embassy. You see, one of the things that um, is widely believed at this point um, was that, well, the US State Department did not know about the 53 coup. They didn't know that the US organized it. That was not known to Kissinger. It wasn't known to Carter, which was why they allowed it the Shah in. Yeah. It was known in the CIA, but they hadn't bothered to tell anybody else about it. It was known to the Ayatollah Khomeini because he was one of the uh, people who the CIA had used to raise the rabble that had brought down Mossadegh. And so one of the things that they were after in the, in the embassy siege was that they wanted to get any of that information and burn it or destroy it so it didn't come out. They also captured large amounts of information um, about the US talking to you know, leftist groups and so on. They used that, the religious authorities who had control of the, uh, the decrypts, well, actually not so much. The furnace that was meant to have destroyed the cables broke down, so they, had, they could only shred them. And, they, and the religious authorities had 
access to a large number of uh, carpet weavers who spent the next seven years putting together the cables piece by piece. And then the ones that uh, were convenient for the religious authorities were then used to liquidate the leftist side of the revolution. And that's how the religious parties got uh, complete control. Now, the Iranian revolution itself was driven by a new media. You know, the, it wasn't the internet, but it was driven by the compact cassette. They, they, they wanted to do, make sure that nobody got, that the US could not use incriminating evidence against the religious powers. And then when they started to discover information that was convenient to them and allowed them to liquidate their enemies, they used that. So Compact Cassette had just come out. And this was how the Ayatollah put out his uh, sermons. Now, why was the cassette more interesting for that than, um, you know, paper? Well, the reason is, well, first of all, you know, you're listening to somebody, it has more power. You know, rhetoric is more powerful than in spoken than on the printed page. But the other thing was that compact cassette has a very interesting fact. You, know, you can look at printed words, and you can pretty soon see whether they're, you know, subversive or not. So it's pretty easy to censor. What they would do with the compact cassettes is that they would have a five-minute, 15-minute segment at the start of the cassette that had music. And only if you wound past that would you get to the uh, sermon uh, calling on uh, people to bring down the Shah. So the Iranian revolution was very much driven by new media. And that was the same in the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution... Probably the most significant part of the media cycle actually was not the internet, but this. Cell phone cameras. Cell phone cameras turn any moment of government abuse into a potential moment of government accountability. And a media cycle had um, been established. Uh, the uh, EU has just announced the Sakharov Prize. It's gone to two Iranian dissidents. Uh, one of them is a filmmaker whose uh, film uh, was uh, shown at the Cannes Festival uh, this year, sorry, last year, 2011. It's called This Is Not A Film because he's banned from making films. Uh, it was smuggled out of the country on a USB key hidden inside a cake. And so basically the media cycle was camera phone, exfiltration by USB key, by tour, whatever. Once it's out of the country, the person who's received it can now get in touch with the extended, you know, the expat uh, resistance uh, via Twitter. And uh, if you follow Oxford Girl, you know, Oxford Girl was at the center of the redistribution of information. And then finally, it's broadcast back into the country via satellite. Uh, BBC World Service. Now, you know, if you were in Iran, you would not get away with a dish that looked like that. <laughs> but, you know, if I, if, if I put a camouflaged one, you know. And, you know, this, this did not have the desired effect in Iran, but it did bring down the governments of Tunisia and Egypt. And this, is, uh, this was shot in Tahrir Square in April of last year. And the medium there was Facebook. Now, in terms of Tahrir Square, the, um, the significance of Facebook, I believe, was not during the revolution itself, but in the years beforehand, in that people who were not too happy with their government could connect up with like-minded people and discover that they were of like mind. And it was the social networks formed through s s Facebook that later were built on, you know, when the uh, Arab Spring started, when the spark hit, there were those networks of people who knew each other and trusted each other existing. And that was what drove the Arab Spring. So Facebook was important, but you know, not actually during the process itself, because you know, the one of the first things that the uh, Egyptian government did 
was to cut off the internet, which might actually have been one of their biggest mistakes because, you know, if you're a keyboard jockey, you know, fighting the uh, revolution from your house and the internet goes out, well, what can you do? You know, if you want to find out what's going on, you go out into the street. <coughs> so, you know, so that's, that part is all psychological operations. It's all, it's all part of information engagement. It's not use of force, but it's certainly a part of the things that you do in warfare. Stuxnet is different. Stuxnet is actually a use of force. Uh, is everybody here familiar with uh, Stuxnet at least? You know. okay. So it was discovered in July 2010. It's not just one virus. There are actually multiple var variants that were set off against Iran. And in addition, there's now <laughs> an even larger number of variants where people have taken that code and that framework and used it for pretty much every imaginable type of malice against every imaginable type of uh, target. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you can throw these weapons at people, and then they throw them back at you. Stuxnet uh, probably reduced the, ura the uranium production of it, enriched uranium by 30%. Which, you know, okay, so they delayed this Iranian nuclear program, which you know, being, we, we've been, as Colbert said the other day, we've been told that uh, Iran is on minutes away from, produ from producing a bomb for the past 12 years. So it delayed them, maybe, but one of the facts, one of the features of it was it used signed code. It had to load up a couple of device drivers, and those were signed, you know, that's part of its root kit strategy. They were signed, uh, apparently with legitimately issued code signing certificates, but the attackers had somehow managed to pilfer the keys. Um, the point here is that we started attacking the internet PKI. At the time it first came out, there were various estimates of how much it cost to write, and th those ranged from between, the lowest I saw was half a million, and the highest was about two million. So this was before we knew who, d who did it. After it was discovered, after the US admitted that it had done it, the uh, cost estimate went up to 100 million. <laughs> I kid you not. Yeah, all right, the, the other thing, I, I, I was uh, talking to some people from uh, one of the Pentagon, you know, postgrad uh, schools, and she told me that uh, you know this was before the attribution had be come through, and you know they were spending, you know, about a million working out who had set Stuxnet off. These are problematic weapons at best. So the Komodo was attacked in uh, March 15, 2011. Or rather, our reseller was attacked. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, when we went back and looked through the logs, it appears that the attacker consciously decided to go after the periphery rather than striking directly at the home base. So we, ha we, we saw a couple of probes, but they don't, it appears that they had chosen the reseller um, that they targeted because they thought it would be easier to go through one of the resellers than uh, attack a security company directly. Uh, we don't know exactly how the reseller was breached. What we do know is that they were not breached by an idiotic password. This seems to be one of the new tropes that comes out. You know, do you hear that Bashir Assad's uh, email was hacked? And uh, the claim there is that some really ridiculously easy password was used. Well, I'm kind of skeptical about this because, you know, if, if, if you have one of these political attacks and you're asked, well, how you do it? Well, you don't want to tell anybody. Telling people that it was a really simple password is a convenient way of, A, stopping them asking the question, and B, making the target look even stupider. So in this case, we know that the vector was more complicated than a simple, to easy to guess password. Uh, we suspect that what happened was that uh, they got some malware onto the reseller's machines, scanned their networks, and then 
Yeah. Once you get a toehold, you can get in and uh, destroy all the evidence. Uh, they found an API that was used by the reseller to request certs from our CA center and requested seven certificates. Um, now, one of the things about that was that it appears that they were doing this kind of like um, testing to see what they could do rather than with an immediate objective of, okay, we've got a production system, we're going to load these certs immediately. Um, we detected the breach while it was actually in, in progress. The reason for this was that uh, although they'd found the API that was used to request certs, that wasn't the only form of communication between the CA issue center and the reseller. There was also an email that was sent back telling the reseller which, you know, here are the certs that you've just requested. And then the reseller saying, well, I didn't ask for a cert for Google. And so the reason that only seven domains were taken was that um, the issue with, you know, the, the CA system was shut down while the attack was going on. Um, so the, re the reseller notified us um, and you know, the response plan went into play. So the first part on the first thing, so the first thing in the response plan was revoking the certificates. Uh, unfortunately, revoking certificates doesn't really do much good at the moment because the browsers don't really check revocation. What happens is that they check to see if the certificate is revoked. If they get a response back, they'll use the response. Otherwise, if they don't get about any response, they'll assume the certificate is valid. We notified all the other browser providers. And shortly after, uh, I forgot to put this on the slide, we also notified our competitors. Uh, the browsers started development of patches. Uh, we notified all the subjects of the certificates, and we turned off, you know, we turned off all the reseller switches. And one of the things that sh we discovered was that the reseller, the reason that the attack had happened was that the reseller had the ability to issue certificates uh, on the basis of their own validation, which wasn't what we intended. We had a database. You know, they were not being audited. If they were going to do their own validation, they should have been audited. So basically, it was a, the security policy was right, but we failed to audit our security policy and noticed that there was this one party that uh, had more privileges than they should. And we also notified the FBI and others. So the information we gathered, well, we knew that the IP address had come from Iran. That wasn't proof that this was an Iranian government attack, but as you see, we'll see it. Uh, you know, you'll, uh, we knew that the request for the cert status was coming from the same address. We only actually saw one OCSP request for certificate status, um, and by then we'd already revoked the certificate. They didn't seem to check the other certificates. And then we started to get email from the attacker trying to, to make out that, uh, you know, because he, he was discovered in the middle. So the attacker contacted the reseller, and the reseller was forwarding the messages on to us, and then the attacker contacted us directly. Um, and they were trying to lay this trail to Iran, with, so, sorry, to Israel. Uh, and they had this whole website that was basically cut and paste from some real Israeli firms. So the problem here was disclosure in that you, know, you don't want to say that there is a problem before you've got a fix. And the browser patches, uh, patching the browsers, turned out it was going to take eight days. Uh, a researcher and tour, Jacob Applebaum, looked at the CRL entries that were in the release of Firefox, worked out that something was up, and uh, then contacted, uh, you know, asked what's up, and we said, well, you know, we've got an issue here filled him in on it, and he agreed not to issue, not to go public for three days. Uh, we made the public announcement, and then, yeah. The thing that I found most bizarre about this was that, you know, when, when I, you know, when my CEO is out there saying, we've been attacked by the Iranian government, and people are saying, oh, you're just saying that it's Iran so that it doesn't look so important. I mean, really, I mean, like, you know, 
I'm pretty sure that if we had not mentioned Iran, that it would not have been on the front page of the New York Times. The reason that we mentioned Iran was purely because we needed to tell people that, hey, we're being attacked, you might be attacked. We wanted to make sure the whole industry was aware that there is this threat vector out. Shortly after we went live, we, you know, this guy calling himself Komodo Hacker uh, pops up and tries to spin himself. Um, this goes on and on and on. Basically, Completely different to the email sent in uh, directly to us. You know, completely different person. Actually, uh, these are written by a Farsi speaker. The earlier ones uh, were not. Uh, we believe it was a different. Um, and he's also coming up completely the Israel, the uh, Iranian government line. Now, it might, now the other thing is that he's giving interviews to the BBC World Service. Now, you know, if you're living in a dictatorial regime and you're telling them that you have managed to subvert the entire uh, internet for that regime for whatever purpose, well, I don't think that you'd be there. So anyway, he, he was trying a reputation attack on us because you know, they didn't want um, this, the Iranian connection to be discussed. So that you know, the paste bin thing was all about trying to get us to shut up. Uh, and so I went on the World Service and started, you know, explained what happened and then started giving the Iranian opposition tips on how to protect themselves. Like, you know, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard has got, uh, has root-kitted browsers that they distribute. So one consequence, and I'm, I'm almost... So one consequence here was that uh, the industry came together. You know, once the wolf is at your door, then you circle the wagons and you defend yourself. So the consequence was we just came to an agreement that an attack on one is an attack on all. And so what had been a rather fractious um, organization, the CA Browser Forum, you know, with the CAs very much op opposed to each other, suddenly came together and facing the common enemy. This lesson was not learned by DigiNotar. Uh, they were breached a couple of months later. They had a total compromise. They lost control of their signing unit. They didn't actually lose control of the key. We don't believe the key was extracted. But the machine that the signing unit was connected to was owned. They lost the machines with the audit logs. So they had issued several hundred certs, and nobody knows what they are. It was detected a month later. It was not reported. The fact that it was not reported led to the arrest of three opposition uh, persons in Iran. As a result, uh, DigiNotar faced the uh, internet death penalty. Uh, the company went into bankruptcy, and the CA has been completely liquidated. Uh, its roots of trust are no longer in the uh, browsers. But they had an audit. They did have an audit. The problem was that the audit was for a completely different system to the one breached. I won't go into flame apart from to say that it's kind of like the kitchen sink of malware. You know, 20 megabytes? And it targeted Microsoft. They compromised a Microsoft CA. That was done by the US government. And this has a problem for me because, as I just said, attack on all one is an attack on all. So now we've got a part of the US government that has basically directly attacked the US information security world. Their, choose, their choice. And so this is the situation we have today. We've got two sets of belligerents having their own little private war, and we're in the middle. We're looking at ways to change the infrastructure to make it more resistant to this type of attack. Uh, you know, there's perspectives, convergence, sovereign. Uh, certificate transparency is the only one that's likely to happen. But the real problem here, as I see it, is you've got a four corner model, and we've always been trying to think of the browser as being the proxy for the user. And as, you know, as every discussion here about JavaScript proves, 
the browsers are not security motivated. They're not good proxies for the users. And so I'm promoting this idea, OmniBroker, where the idea is that we'll have a security specialist in there, an antivirus provider, a McAfee, a Symantec, a Komodo antivirus. So conclusions, it isn't always about money. In fact, in this case, money isn't the motive. You can't defend yourself against an attack by, making, by raising the cost of attack because the resources, on the other hand, are practically infinite. State actors are a threat, but they're not a threat that, they're not the most common a threat. And you might be hit by your side just as well, much as the other, because they're not going after us directly, they're going after other parties through us. We get, we're working to reinforce the trust infrastructure, it's gonna take time, and have a response plan. If DigiNotar had really thought this through and thought through the consequences of a, a breach in advance, it wouldn't have been as bad. So I think we've got a few moments for questions. Anybody? <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, well basically Moxie took over the perspectives things and now it's called Convergent. There's a number of problems with it. One of them is Moxie proposed, well, he proposed this system at Black Hat now, the year before last now. He then described it at RSA, and I, you know, I asked him, well, bring it to YTF, write a draft, write a specification. He said, oh, no, I don't want to do any of that. You know, I'm just going to work directly with the browser providers. I was kind of like, well, you know, if, you're going to, if this is going to go anywhere, you've got to write a specification. I'm not going to decide whether I'm going to implement something based on your code, thank you very much. So with perspective and convergence, we don't have a specification. It's a year later, so essentially I don't see that that's, that's going anywhere. There are also problems with the proposal, and that is it relies on this notary infrastructure that he predicates as being you know, open source. Now, one of the things about open source is that open source software works really, really well for one simple reason. The marginal cost of production of software is zilch. Services are different. Infinity times zero is infinity. Infinity times a negligible amount starts to add up. And pretty soon, you know, if you've got something that all the browsers are going to be depending on, if you've not got a business model to support it, well, those small deltas start to add up really fast. And, you know, so for Google, you know, well, they, their statement on perspectives, if they were going to support it, they would have to support the notary themselves. And so... Um, it might have been a good idea, but the presentation really didn't address that. With OmniBroker, I've tried to address that issue by saying, okay, we'll have a party in there that has a business model because, you know, antivirus is a product that people buy. We know how to sell antivirus, and in fact, we can even make it free to the end user by getting banks and whatever to pay for it. Um, Google Certificate Transparency, again, they've got a business model behind it because although it requires this notary infrastructure, they've got a good idea of who's going to be running it and who's going to be funding it. All right, let's take the speaker. Thank you very much.